Let's Thank now you. end the first presentation by Father Francis Tonipara, uh, a conifer and a colleague of mine, who is an expert in church history and a person who loves the Malabar church to the depth of his heart. Father Francis, a former major superior, the provincial of St. Thomas Province, Coricode, will be speaking to us on multiple jurisdiction and pastoral and missionary endeavors of the Surah Malabar Church for all of the consecrated communities. May I now request Father Francis to begin his presentation. Father Francis, please. Respected generals, provincials, and delegates, good evening to one and all. The, at the outset, let me thank Father Saji for uh, the president of S SMRC for organizing such a relevant topic. We had some, some discussions in 2010. I had, a, I had a paper presentation to all the major superiors of SMRC in Kakanad and in uh, Bhopal, hoping to have the realization of all India jurisdiction. So how we had to prepare ourselves, but afterwards, Bishop Sebastian Vadakel arranged it afterwards, nothing happened. And also it was also a context where there was a proposal for a guidelines prepared by the uh, Mount St. Thomas or the major archiepiscopal Kuria for the collaborative work of the consecrated people and the, uh, the uh, hierarchy. So that also, I think that was not also realized actually. So in this context, I present my paper. It is having 12 parts. Don't worry about the 12 parts and all will finish soon. And the first part is regarding, and also, sorry, I had to also thank Father Jerry for giving, giving a grand welcome to this session. Father Jerry, thank you. So first part is on general uh, historical note. Second part is on St. Thomas Christians and the historical background which led to the jurisdictional restrictions in, of this apostolic church. And third part is on the ecclesial dimensions of consecrated life. Fourth part, success story of the consecrated people in the pastoral care and mission work. Fifth, factors which led to the flow of St. Thomas Christians to other Suyuri churches as individuals. Suro Malabar consecrated members in Latin dioceses. Sura Malabar consecrated people undertake mission outside India, both developed and developing countries. Pastoral care of the migrants in India and abroad. Collaboration of the Institute of Consecrated Life in the light of the church documents like the Second Vatican Council, Canon Law, Particular Laws of the Sura Malabar Church, etc. Collaboration with the other Sui Jewish churches. Concrete steps regarding the collaboration between the hierarchy and the institutes of consecrated life need for the need of the guidelines for a collaborative effort so these are the 12 points first point you know that that is uh, from the very beginning of the church the apostles spread the gospel but at the same time we see an organized movement from the part of the religious if you take for example summarize the whole thing for take example if you take the irish church it was a monastic church all the bishops from monasteries and these people eventually moved to Germany and other Italy and Switzerland. If you go to Switzerland, you can see the Irish monks, the successors of the, the, the work of the Irish monks in Switzerland, even in Italy, Bobbio, for example. So the monks had an integral part in the expansion of the church. Of course, the diocesan priests, of course, they play a key role. But at the same time, the pioneer work is being done by the monks. And the first organized way of evangelization was done by, carried out by, during the time of, of Grigory the Great, somewhere in 596, he sent a group of people under the leadership of Benedictine monks, under the leadership of Augustine to England. Then later he came to be known as Augustine of Canterbury. And Augustine called, uh, started the church in England and bringing the church in direct contact with the Roman church and monasteries were the centers of missionary activities. And these monasteries eventually produced uh, missionaries to Germany. So we can see, uh, one century later, we can see Boniface is the apostle of the German church. So this is the situation. Then coming to the medieval time, we can see the Cluny movement, the Cluny. 
Then we have the, the Trinitarians, we have the, the Franciscans, Dominicans, Carthusians, Cistercians, all these people. In 1291, Franciscans and Dominicans were in India. 1291. Then afterwards, we have the Westernism, then we have the uh, Protestant Reformation and all. So the missionaries, the religious started taking another direction. So we have the activity oriented. Societies are being emerged. Society of Jesus, Somascans, Chameleons, Colopians, then a congregation of Jesus, then the Ursulines and other people. But they brought the gospel to the ends of the world. That is in Latin America. The whole Latin America is being converted, mainly because of the missionary enterprises of these people. Then again, we have the setback during the French Revolution. We have the setback. But again, a revival in the middle of the 19th century, focusing more on Asia and uh, India. Asia, in Asia and Africa. Asia and Africa. So further, we can see that we have a number of religious communities coming up, even among our own communities, starting with uh, Mahanam in 1831, then we have a number of religious communities. So this is the historical background. So when we speak about the St. Thomas Christians and the historical background, what happened to the uh, St. Thomas Christians? With the arrival of the Portuguese, till that time, we have the All India jurisdiction. Uh, we are called the Archdeacon of All India, Metropolitan of All India. All these were, systems were there. But in 1610, the territory was limited to Krangannur and Kochi, the territory of the St. Thomas Christians. And that was being restored only in 2017 with the historic letter of Pope Francis on, on 9th October 2017. So we had to wait for 407 years. So this is the context in which now we have all the chances to go anywhere in India and to, pre, as Father Saji has, Saji has mentioned, go anywhere in India and preach the gospel. So this is the relevance of the meeting. So in between what happened, since we are restricted, especially when our hierarchy was re-established, again we are restricted to Pamba and Paradapula, uh, Paradapura, we have a lot of missionary enthusiasm. For example, the Cherush uh, Pamishiling and other, other agencies started promoting occasions. We have a number of occasions. But unfortunately, they cannot work in the territories outside the Pamba and Paradapura. So they slowly started moving to the Latin territories, opting for the Latin mission dioceses and all. So there is nothing wrong in that. If you look at the story of the Latin mission dioceses in North and Northeast India, the, the majority of the personnel coming from the Suram Alabar background, even sisters, fathers, brothers, all. So that was a great contribution from our part. And the CMI congregation wanted to do some missionary work and first time we went to Raigar Ambiyapur in the 1950s. That was the first thing. So, impressed by the missionary activity, missionary commitment of the Sira Malabarians, Eugene D'Souza, the Archbishop of Bhopal, uh, uh, decided to hand over a particular area, that is the Chanda Mission in 1962. That is a historical event where we have a territory, not full freedom, but we have a particular territory where we could do the mission work according to our traditions. Then later, getting inspiration from the success story of the, of the, of the Chanda mission, we got a number of dioceses. And you also remember that all these eparchies, the early it was called uh, uh, the exarchates, all were handed over to the religious communities or to the society, MST and all. So that means the mobility is normally from the part of the religious communities. So this is the background. Then again, we have the problem of migration. You know that uh, when the uh, 1930s, people started migrating to North India and North Kerala, not, not North India, North Kerala, then our fathers, CMI fathers, accompanied them eventually uh, with the visit of Cardinal Tizarang in 1953, we got the Diocese of Pellicheri. Then we, we could cross the river Paradapula. And also we could cross the river Pamba. 1955, the territory was extended to Coimbatur, Palakkad, and other places, and the Nilagiri district, and, and uh, Kanyagumari districts, and other places. So we have further expansion. But during the 19, 
50s and 60s, our people started moving to different parts of India. Migration uh, started taking place in a different, in a very power, a strong way. And also at the same time, you can see that we have high range migration that also happened. But the migration to outside Kerala is causing a problem now, the pastoral care. So eventually, Pope France, Pope John Paul II had a letter in 1986 to the bishops of India saying that you get ready for a diocese exclusively for the a park exclusively for the Syrian Christians outside Kerala. That eventually happened in 1980, 1988. 1987 was the letter. 1988, we have the Kalyan diocese. And before that, 1978. Antony Padira, Archbishop Antony Padira was appointed as the visitor to study and present the report. So what privileges now we enjoy, we had to pay a big price that we had to remember. Then we argued for a, we got the major archiepiscopal status. Then eventually we got the All India jurisdiction. So this is the historical background. Then from the very day on, I was on the Shamshabad diocese. Bishop Rafael Tapril is a good friend of mine. Then I, I used to say to him, make use of the religious. Thousands are there. Make use of the religious to realize the All India jurisdiction as a reality or to realize the, 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 the dreams of the All India jurisdiction. But do you know that our synod, unfortunately, had many other issues they had to deal with. So practically, then they never took much interest in this collaborative effort. That is why I said in the beginning, the relevance of this meeting today. We are not uh, saying that we are an exclusive, uh, we are not an exclusive community, only Sura Malabar. No, we have the global mission. We don't forget that. And also so there are religious communities which are well established in, uh, in uh, different Latin dioceses. We are not going to have a confrontation with those, uh, those things. But now we have to do is, we have to rethink seriously about our mission commitment. And we have to rethink seriously about our uh, mission commitment to the Sui Juris Church, that is our Apostolic St. Thomas Christians or the Sura Malabar Church. Not forgetting our commitment to the, to the global mission, not forgetting our commitment to the others. Already we have the, the mission we have already undertaken. But now we should have a new awareness how we could put into practice the concept of the All India Jurisdiction. Some of the diocese are already started, but from our side, we should have a clear idea how we have to collaborate with the hierarchy, the, the major archiepiscopal uh, the, uh, system, how we, have to, we can collaborate with the, this major archiepiscopal church in promoting the, the evangelization work or Adhijanda's mission in the territory extended to us. When the Shamshabad diocese was, a, a party was established, he said that the diocese includes all the territories which are not part of the existing Sivra Malabar. So that means one of the, the biggest diocese in the world. But unfortunately, they don't have enough personnel. So we are the one to support them with our personnel and other things. And the consecrated church, consecrated people are basically, they are the people for the church. Consecrated life is for the church. For example, we have Mita Consecrata number 31 or Lumen Gens in number 3. We have references. The special task of consecrated life is to keep alive in baptized persons an awareness of the fundamental values of the gospel, bearing witness in a splendid and striking way that the world cannot be transfigured and offered to God without the spirit of the Beatitudes. That is being represented by the religious, consecrated ones. So consecrated people should have a mission. The church, is, church exists because the church is having a mission. The same way, more than that, the consecrated people also should have a participatory role in the mission of the church, especially in the mission of the Adhijandas and other, other missions. And sharing the mission of the church is the core of the consecrated life. Sharing the mission of the church. And also we have a number of success stories. I already mentioned about some of the stories. For example, we have the reunion happened in 1930. 
It is a concerted effort of the religious to bring the Malang, the Jacobites, the Orthodox back to the Catholic Church. Then we accompanied them. We accompanied them. So we have a number of stories like that, even in our uh, uh, Kerala context. Take the story of the high range migration. Take the story of the migration in Bangalore or in Delhi or in, uh, in Bombay or in Pune. Even during the Second World War, our fathers were there to accompany the migrants. So we have uh, stories like that. So in that context, now we have a wider expansion of this scope. So we have to make use of this and you are the people to decide. And also we have now, we should create a new consciousness that ours is a sui juris church. Of course, we have three churches in India, as Saju has beautifully mentioned, in this context, how we could work together. We are not going for a confrontation or we are not going to create any problems with our all India jurisdiction. But at the same time, it is our duty to see that we, we preach the gospel to the ends of it, the borders of Indian borders of India. Arunachal Pradesh, there are already people there. So in this context, we should think seriously about our mission and our membership in the Sui Juris Church and the, and the, the commitment we should have. Then coming to that, we should also say that uh, the collaboration in the light of the church documents, there are a number of documents which speak about the collaborative mission one should undertake. Second Vatican Council, for example, canon law, particular laws of the Zero Malabar Church, mission policy of the Zero Malabar Church, all these things are at our disposal to have a collaborative mission together with the Sui Juris, our Sui Juris Church. So, and the Second Vatican Council clearly, then in Duman JNC numbers 30, 43 to 47, clearly speak about the role of religious as collaborators in the mission of the church. 43 to 47. And again, Christus Dominus number on bishops, or bishop's office number 33, clearly speaks about all religious have the duty, each according to his proper occasion, of cooperating zealously and diligently in building up the, in, the increasing and building up and increasing the whole mystical body of Christ and for the good of the particular churches. 33, CD number 33. So we have, and canon law, we have number 413 speaks about that. And this collaborative elements includes the religious are obliged to discharge their duties in such a way that they may be available and docile helpers to the bishops. Speak of that. So the other way also, they should be also collaborative to the religious. Hierarchy also should be collaborative to the religious. Particular laws in 2003, there are few numbers, 87, 90, and 93, speak about the religious and the hierarchy. But unfortunately, the latest particular law, that is of 2006, that gives in part three guidelines for pastoral collaboration, but not giving much details. And the mission policy of the Sura Malabar Church that also speaks about, that is published in 2006, that speaks, uh, number seven, speaks about these collaborative efforts. And in CBC and CRI, there is a document that is called the Mutual Relations. Mutual Relations of bishops and religious in number six speaks about the effort should be made to strengthen the bonds of fraternity and cooperation between the diocesan clergy and the communities of religious. Great importance should be placed on all those means which serve the increased mutual trust. Now we have the question of the collaboration with the other Suiyuri churches. That is also another point we have to discuss seriously. And eventually we think of having even in Latin provinces in other countries, for example, in Africa or other places. Because you know that the, those Italian congregations which are dependent only on their own occasions all disappeared in course of time. All disappeared. All the religious communities which got out of Italy and got established in different parts. For example, Capuchins. They came in the 17th century in India. They have a number of provinces now in India. Even Sierra Malabar provinces they are having, OCDs. The same way we may also think of when we have a sizable number of members, 
think of having even the Latin provinces. You can think about that. That is the sharing of our mission with the other churches. Not imposing our identity there, but at the same time, we are collaborating with other sui juris churches. And uh, uh, then we can also speak about the need of a guidelines. I don't know. I asked, told Saju, we may ask about the progress of that articulation of that guidelines for an effective involvement. There was a committee, I think Father, uh, uh, Father uh, Tanjan was there, a committee that was uh, uh, constituted somewhere in two, uh, 2009 or some even before that uh, to draft the guidelines for a smooth on uh, functioning of the religious and the major and the parties. So that has to be worked out. So as a conclusion, what I wanted to say is the clarification during the, if at all there is any questions, we can have the clarification during the discussion time. What I wanted to say is we are given a golden chance now. Earlier, we used to complain by saying that we have no place to go to work as a missionaries and all. Now, especially the conduct of the, during the prayer time system mentioned about synodality, especially the conduct of the synodal, synod on synodality, that is one of the themes is the mission. So we had to refocus on our mission commitment and reawaken our mission commitment and to make use of this chance of being ex, uh, given the, the all India jurisdiction, we have to go to the uh, borders to the different corners of India and preach the gospel and only we could do systematically and we should have a bargaining power before the sinner to, I told many of the synodal fathers, but nothing happened in between, even Tattil, he invited once, but he could not come for our general chapter of plenary to explain to us how we could collaborate with the Shamshabad diocese and how we could realize in practice in, in, in practice, how we could realize the concept of the whole India jurisdiction. So I may wish all the best and thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you very much.